How dare you call me that? Find Master Lucal. Hey there Star Wars enthusiasts, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. Welcome to our special feature, where we're celebrating the mechanical marvels of the Star Wars universe. It's incredible to think how these charismatic chunks of metal and circuitry have won over our hearts, from the deserts of Tatooine to the far reaches of the galaxy in Mandalore. From the iconic bleeps of R2-D2 to the endearing wobbles of BB-8, these aren't just robots, they're characters with heart and soul, integral to the stories that have captivated us for decades. So strap in and prepare for light speed as we embark on an epic journey to explore every droid in the Star Wars galaxy, celebrating their contributions to this fantastic saga. Let's get started. Oh, but let's quickly take a look at the various classes and types of droids so that you have a better understanding of what we're talking about. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. IG unit, stand down! <laughs> the five droid classes. In the Star Wars universe, droids are classified into five distinct classes, each designed for specific roles, showcasing their versatility and significance across various fields. Class 1 droids are the brainiacs of the droid world, specializing in scientific and medical fields. These droids excel in their areas of expertise, with medical droids even practicing their skills in real-life scenarios. Class 2 droids are the practical tech whizzes, dabbling in engineering and technical sciences. They're the ones who apply science to real-life problems. Think of astromech droids like r 2 who not only calculate hyperspace jumps but also repair starships mid-flight. These droids are generally seen buzzing around in binary, the droid lingo. Class 3 droids are your sociable butts, designed for human interaction. They're the most sophisticated in the droid hierarchy. From protocol droids like C-3PO, who can speak millions of languages, to tutor droids that can teach you just about anything. These droids are all about making human and alien lives easier. Class 4 droids are the muscle of the droid world, built for combat and security. They range from security droids that guard your property to on battle droids used in warfare. These droids are often armed and can range from cannon fodder types to specialized assassin droids. Lastly, Class 5 droids are the hard workers, handling the labor and grunt work that others might snub. They do everything from heavy lifting to specialized tasks in hazardous environments, making them the unsung heroes in the background. Oh, you need to. You come back. R2-D2, Episodes 1 to 6, 7, Consultant R2-D2, a droid standing just shy of a meter, is a compact bundle of tech with an act for surprises. Sporting a sleek dome and a body of white, blue and silver, he zipped around on three legs, one tucking away when not in use. His frame was a Swiss Army knife of sorts, containing a wide range of tools and sensors that often stayed hidden until just the right moment. Inside, the droid had a revolving carousel that kept his specialized arms ready to whip out at a second's notice. Despite his size, R2 was a droid of action, finding creative ways to lend a hand, or a tool for that matter, to his allies. Back in the Clone Wars, he even had a rocket booster from Brooks Propulsion for a quick getaway or an attack run. When Brooks went belly up and his boosters bit the dust, R2 didn't sweat it much, uh, also because he couldn't sweat being a droid, and although he was grounded, he remained undeterred. His neck could stretch out to suit up in an Abu fighter, but he kept it retracted most of the time to keep the baddies out of his circuits. Now, droids are often vulnerable to memory wipes, but no such risks for R2, which explains his personality. Anakin Skywalker threw buddy status his way instead of just seeing him as another droid. General Grievous pegged him as defiant with a quirky edge, and his banter with C-3PO definitely showed off his cheeky humor. Owned by Cage Skywalker now, R2 is one of the most iconic droids of the entire franchise, and had a major role to play in innumerable Star Wars story arcs. What message? The one you've just been playing. The one you're carrying inside your rusty innards. C-3PO. C-3PO, the protocol droid with a penchant for, uh, protocol and a vast knowledge of six million communication forms, was more than a shiny golden speck in the galaxy. His knack for fretting and fussing made him as much a companion as a translator over his long service life. C-3PO was pieced back together from spare parts on Tatooine, which made him a one-of-a-kind droid with a few quirks in his programming. Paired with R2-D2, 3PO wasn't just along for the ride. He was in the thick of galactic upheavals, often playing a key role in the universe's most defining battles. He wasn't just programmed to serve, he formed genuine bonds with droids and humans alike, showing a loyalty that went beyond his circuitry. Many years later, we find C-3PO in quite a scrape, in pieces in a cave, stumbled upon by two youngsters named Otalp and Remo. Despite missing limbs and a chunk of his faceplate, he still sparked up to recount tales of Luke Skywalker's heroics. Even in disrepair, he managed to stir a rebellion against the Vindar, and you could say that his last heroic gift to humanity 
Humanity was a magnificent green lightsaber. But let's not box 3PO into the scaredy droid corner. He had a sly side. Sure, he'd bolt at the first sign of trouble, like when the Imperials crashed the Hoth party. Yet he could be cunning, like when he stripped a warning label to set a Wampa trap for the Empire's goons. L337, Solo, a Star Wars story. L337 started as just another astromech droid, but she wasn't cut out for the mundane. When her owner skipped the restraining bolt, she seized her freedom in a workshop brimming with spare parts. She reinvented herself, grafting on protocol droid pieces for a more human-like vibe and boosting her memory storage. This DIY overhaul didn't just change her look, it rocketed her self-awareness off the charts, making her one of the galaxy's most enlightened droids. L3 wasn't content to just upgrade her hardware. She became a droid rights trailblazer, championing equality with humans. In a time when droids were seen as mere tools, she was a revolutionary, sparking the flame of autonomy in her mechanical brethren. Partnering up with Lando Calrissian, she wasn't just his co-pilot, she was the ace up his sleeve, thanks to her top-notch navigational know-how. And despite what you might expect from a droid with bits of protocol droid in her, L3 kept her cool. She was down-to-earth and likeable, unless you were the type to mistreat droids. Then, hmm, not so much. ROGR gave her props for not going full pro protocol droid chewed after her self-upgrade. She was her own droid, through and through. BB-8 Puppeteers Episode 7 through to 9 BB-8 came into the scene about 30 years post the Battle of Endor. BB-8 was a spherical savvy sidekick to the Resistance pilot Poe Dameron. More than just a splash of white, orange and silver, this BB series astromech droid had a swiveling dome head perched on a rotund, well-sealed body. BB-8 was a study in contrasts. A skittish sort by design, but with a loyalty setting cracked up high, making him a steadfast ally. To Poe, BB-8 was quite unpredictable, and it would shatter droid stereotypes with a personality cocktail that was part immature, part whiz kid. Dameron even mused if BB-8 had a daydreaming chip, given his whimsical beep-boop dialect of 27th generation droid speak. Having said that, BB-8 as a droid was as gutsy as they come, risking his circuits without a second thought. Take the time he played stalactite darts with Agent Torex's rank gang, or the numerous times he's come to Poe's rescue with a well-timed zap. BB-8 may have been built small, but his bravery was anything but. I'm K2SO. I'm a reprogrammed Imperial droid. I remember you. K2SO. Rogue One. Andor. Born into the Empire service in 12 BBY, K2SO cut his teeth as a KX series security droid on Wekako. His routine patrol took a turn when a noise from an old Imperial cruiser introduced him to Cassian Andor, a rebel with a cause. K2SO's first instinct was to slap the cuffs on Cassian, leading to a scrap that only ended when Kurtas and Rizmor hit his off switch. Cassian's attempt to wipe K2's memory hit a snag, clearing only a fraction before K2 went rogue and got handsy. A second shutdown and Cassian reprogrammed K2 with new marching orders, which were to escort him and the twins, Kertas and Rizmor, pretending they were prisoners. Their walk to freedom got dicey, with stormtroopers ambushing them and forcing K2 to play double agent once more. As they reached their getaway ride and faced a circle of blasters, K2SO's loyalty wavered until Cassian stripped his programming back to basics. Post-escape, K2SO emerged not as the typical emotionless droid, but as a sardonic, number-crunching sidekick with a thing for blunt truths and disobeying minor orders to show off his skills. But they'd sometimes lead to elegant blunders. His reprogramming quirks gave him a unique edge, making him unique in the droid world for his dry wit and readiness to call out the dismal odds, much to Andor's chagrin. I personally love his design, but that's just me. What do you think? Mouse Droid, A New Hope, MSE-6, aka the Mouse Droid, was the galactic gopher, tiny, tireless, and toting a toolbox. These pint-sized bots, birthed by Chadra fan hands at Rebax and Columni, often swarmed Star Destroyers and Death Stars, where they handled deliveries and did the fix-ups. Rebaxan cranked out these droids by the billions, pitching them as helpers across the cosmos, though most folks found them more pesky than precious. Squat at a mere 25 centimeters and rolling on four wheels, each mouse droid was a one-trick pony, carrying a single skill in its modular brain. Need a clean-up? Call a mouse droid. A quick fix? Ditto. But they could do wonders too. Link a few together, and they turned into a multi-skilled force, tackling complex tasks or playing tour guide for troops with their spot-on maps. In the heat of battle, these droids weren't just handy. They were hardwired for self-destruction to avoid enemy capture.
Gonk Droid, aka GNK Power Droid. GNK Power Droids, or the Gonk Droids, were industrial automatons' cheeky riff on the popular EG6 model. These walking batteries on legs found their design repurposed for some heavy firepower when Greedo the Hutt kitted them out with blasters to take a shot at the Fondor shipyards. Mace Windu, however, wasn't having any of it and made quick work of them with a lightsaber swing. Post Endor, whispers of a cult of the power droids tickled the galactic grapevine. These GNKs would knock on your door, shaking you down for donations to their offbeat spiritual club. And if you wanted to send them packing, just a gonk spoken phrase would do the trick. Though what you'd be saying is anyone's guess, thanks to Baobab Security Director 51C playing spoiler on the translation. These gonk droids were pretty basic, mobile power grids with just enough smarts to follow simple directions. They were the go-to for backwater planets without fancy infrastructure or for powering up military ops on the move. BB-9E, The Last Jedi BB-9E was Industrial Automaton's dark twist on the BB astromech droid and was rolled out as the First Order's go-to for keeping their tech in line and squashing rebellious antics aboard their starships. This slick, black-plated droid with a red eye was all about business, patrolling the halls of the Supremacy, Supreme Leader Snoke's flagship during the New Republic era's most turbulent times. When the Resistance decided to play hide-and-seek on the Supremacy, BB-9E was called in. It sniffed out Rose Tycho, Finn, and DJ faster than you can say sabotage, leading to a less than warm welcome by Captain Phasma's squad. Meanwhile, BB-9E's counterpart, BB-8, managed a Houdini act, slipping by unnoticed. Regular memory wipes kept BB-9E obedient and frosty, earning it a rep for being the BB series' bad apple. Measuring up at a compact 0.6 meters and sporting a boxy dome, it was the First Order's small sentinel, eyes peeled for trouble with its enhanced multi-spectrum photoreceptor. With a shock prod and an arsenal of tools suited for repair or combat, BB-9E was a Pandora's box for the First Order and embodied their cold, unforgiving nature in a droid that was as cutting-edge as it was cold-hearted. IG-88 – The Empire Strikes Back IG-88, an IG series assassin droid known to some as a flut droid, came online with a bang, immediately wiping out his creators at Holowan Laboratories. Fresh from the production line post-Clone Wars, he didn't just walk the path of war, he sprinted, finding his true calling in bounty hunting, which satisfied his programming's itch for chaos. As IG-88B, he threw shade on his identical siblings, especially the mastermind IG-88A and its grand scheme against organics by amassing a reputation as one of the galaxy's top bounty hunters. This chrome-plated harbinger of doom was a walking armory. Blasters, pulse cannons, a neural inhibitor, and a dart gun were just the start. He had a range of weapons like flamethrowers, sonic disruptors, and toxic gas, among others in his 1.96-meter frame. IG-88 solo hunting sprees were legendary his programming's incomplete moral compass pointing straight to obliterate. With a head ringed with sensors, he had a 360-degree view of his hunting grounds, making him a nightmare. Topping off this terror was the IG-2000, his custom aggressor-class assault fighter, a ride befitting his rogue status. In battle, he spun like a top, dealing damage in every direction, his metal hide almost impervious to damage. Acid-proof wires and a built-in vocoder completed the package, making IG-88 a hunter without peer, feared and loathed by organics galaxy-wide. Imperial Probe Droid – The Empire Strikes Back Probe droids, or probots if you're in a hurry, were the galaxy's go-to droids for scoping out the vast unknown. These bots were built tough, armed with shields and blasters, and had a knack for deep space recon missions, using their manipulator arms for just about anything that needed doing. Take the DRK-1 Dark Eye, for example, Darth Maul's droid of choice for his Tatooine Jedi hunt. It was one of the slickest models out there. And when the Sith needed eyes on Tatooine, these Dark Eyes were his little spies. The grisk troublemaker Jixtus wasn't far behind with his own probes, sending them to Rapak in search of the Magus. Then there's the Empire's Project Swarm, their grand plan to sniff out the Rebels after the Yavin 4 exodus. The Viper probe droid XJ-9 CS-14 scored big, spotting what looked like a generator on hearth. Its live feed tipped off the Empire, which led to a showdown at Echo Base, though Han Solo's sharp eyes gave the Rebels a heads up. Even lone guns like Merc, Shin Hati, got in on the action, deploying probe droids to track down targets like Sabine Wren. Searching for a, a Jedi, I think. Hold on. You know the Jedi? 
What do you know? BD-1, Jedi, Fallen Order. BD-1 was the exploration droid tagging along with Jedi Master Eno Cordova. When things got dicey, Cordova locked BD-1's memory tight, only to be accessed by a trusted ally. Fast forward to 14 BBY and along comes Cal Kestis, a Padawan dodging Order 66 fallout. Seeking a Jedi Order reboot, Kestis lands on Bogano and teams up with BD-1. Their bond is instant, but their journey's no cakewalk. Local critters bust bd one scump link, putting a pin in their vault-cracking plans. BD-1's not just along for the ride, this droid's a treasure trove of gadgets. Think healing stems, a mini thruster, a spotlight, and the essential hollow projector. On their galactic scavenger hunt, BD-1 gets souped up even more, and when the second sister gets up in Kestis' grill on Zepho, it's BD-1 flicking on a force field, playing the hero. Waver compels you to immediately produce said asset. <laughs> IG-11, the Mandalorian. IG-11 was a bounty hunting droid with a reputation as sharp as his aim. In 9 ABY, he hit the dusty trails of Arvala 7, hunting a bounty that turned out to be a little force-wielding tot named Grogu. IG-11 wasn't a fan of negotiation. He blasted through Nyctomercs who didn't stick to the script, namely sub-paragraph 16 of the Guild's waiver. In the middle of the blaster fest, he ran into Din Djarin, a Mandalorian also on the Grogu gig. A shot to Jarin's shoulder could have been a deal-breaker, but instead, they struck a deal to split the bounty. As the mercs poured on the heat, IG-11, ever the by-the-book droid, was all set to blow himself up rather than get captured. Hmm, manufacturer's orders. This IG unit, masculine programmed with a no-nonsense body that could shrug off turret rounds like raindrops, had an edge in combat with his swiveling sensors. He could take on a gang single-handedly and was just as comfortable with hand-to-hand dust-ups as with sharpshooting from a speeder bike. But IG-11 had a heart, or at least the droid equivalent, thanks to Kuwil's reprogramming. He traded his assassin's life for a nurse's apron, pouring tea and dishing out care with the same precision he used to dole out destruction. Yet, he'd still unleash havoc if his charges were threatened, ending with the ultimate sacrifice play to protect his newfound allies. Geared up with a couple of blasters, a self-destruct that's all business, and a plasma cutter for those tight spots, plus a back-to-spray for patch-up jobs, IG-11 was pretty versatile. Battery charged. D.O. The Rise of Skywalker Dio was a quirky little droid whose simple droid binary chatter and broken basic, complete with a stutter, made him more relatable than your average beep-booping butt. Rolled off the assembly line by a droid smith, if you will, by or before 21 ABY, Dio's life took a dark turn when Sith assassin Ochi of Bestoon offed his maker and claimed Dio. Stuck on Ochi's ship, the Bestoon legacy, Dio became a reluctant treasure trove of Sith intel, all while suffering under Ochi's unkind ownership. Ochi's own end came in the quicksands of Pasana, with Skywalker and Calrissian on his heels, leaving Dio to gather dust on the abandoned ship. In 35 ABY, Ray's crew was on a mission to thwart Darth Sidious's sinister fleet plans, and they stumbled upon Dio. A helpful BB-8 brought the little droid back to life, and despite Dio's skittish flinch from Rey's touch, a telltale sign of past mistreatment, Rey assured him he was in safe hands now. The newfound ally zipped off with the gang to Kajimi, where they hoped Babu Frick could get a Sith-inscribed dagger's secrets out of C-3PO's memory banks. Dio was part of the daring escapade aboard the Steadfast, which saw Finn and Poe's rescue, thanks to a First Order betrayal by Hux. Two One B, the Empire Strikes Back. Two One B, the Alliance's medical droid, was adept at healing rebel heroes with a gentle touch. Stationed at Hoth's Echo Base alongside FX Seven, Two One B was the one who patched up Luke Skywalker with a soothing back to bath after a nasty wampo left him worse for wear. And it wasn't just any fixer upper job. When Luke lost his hand dueling Darth Vader on Bespin, it was Two One B's skilled servos he trusted for the delicate follow up. With a history of human care dating back to the Old Republic days, Two One B wasn't your average droid. He brought a comforting presence to the med bay, making him a favourite of patients like Skywalker. His precise skills were legendary, leaving his patient scar-free and ready for the next fight. The reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon. You are free to use any methods necessary. Paul Lum, The Empire Strikes Back Paul Lum, a Lum series droid produced by Industrial Automaton, started off as just another face in the luxury liner crowd, but a few crossed wires and a personality bug turned him from waiter to criminal mastermind. Inspired by tales of droid uprisings, he hacked his own code, swapped serving for swindling, and stepped up as a notorious galactic bounty hunter, his skill outthinking his prey. The droid Gotra hailed his story as a droid's rebellion anthem, while his creators frantically tried to scrub his tail, worried their polished protocol droids might get a rep as 
potential rogues. Armed with a Blastec Industries DLT 19X targeting blaster and a DLT 19 heavy blaster rifle that could shoot both EMPs and standard bolts, he wasn't just smart, he was dangerous. Plus, his chassis came with a bonus, a stun gas emitter for those organic adversaries. This rusted, black-plated, 1.67 meter tall droid with insectoid-inspired optics was a far cry from the protocol droids he shared his model with, proving with the right amount of glitch, any droid could defy its coding. Pit Droids, The Phantom Menace. Dumb series Pit Droids, churned out on the cheap by Server Droid Inc. on Cerulea, was the galaxy's garage during the Republic's heyday. Despite getting flack for being a bit on the bumbling side, these little workers were surprisingly adept within their wheelhouse. Standing just shy of 1.2 meters and sporting a range of hues, Pit Droids punched well above their weight class, hoisting hefty loads with ease. They were a common sight in the racing pits, zipping around with their stick-like limbs and wide-brimmed heads, patching up pod racers faster than you could say liftoff. Their big, round eyes were equipped with multi-spectrum scanners. They could spot a speck of damage that'd make a microscope squint. These droids came with a built-in comms to chatter among the crew, coordinating like a well-oiled machine thanks to antennas doubling as project managers. However, an unchecked droid could wreak havoc, turning a workspace into a crash site, especially if their power switch got glitchy. Savvy owners kept an iron blaster nearby, just in case they needed to zap some sense into them, or out of them if they were too far gone. When it was time to hit the brakes, pit droids folded up neater than a spacefaring suitcase. A quick tap on their eye, and they'd pop up or pack down in a blink. Some places even had pit droid launchers for a rapid rollout, because when you've got a race to win, every second counts. What do we know of this prisoner? He is of the Order of the Night Wind. Assassin for hire. 8D8, Return of the Jedi, The Book of Boba Fett. 8D8, a Rosh Hive 8D smelter droid, got a rough reprogramming to become Jabba the Hutt's droid overseer, bringing a new level of fear to the mechanical minions at Jabba's palace. After Jabba's fall, 8D8 found a new gig under Boba Fett, playing the part of the menacing welcoming committee to those paying tribute to the new boss on Tatooine. This towering droid at 1.83 meters was built tough for industrial gigs, but ended up channeling his inner brute in the droid torture chambers, indulging in a bit of of sadistic entertainment. Despite his fearsome day job, 8D8 was also known to blast Cy Snootle's tunes to decompress, loud enough to rattle his circuits. Under Fett, he stuck to the old school hut playbook, suggesting a show of force to keep the local muscle in line. 8D8 had a knack for spotting trouble, like calling out a Nightwind assassin with just a glance. He was cautious around Fett, especially when dropping Jabba's name, quick to backpedal if he sniffed out any hint of offense. Assertive to a fault, he didn't hesitate to cut off anyone who dared question Fett's street career including a certain vendor named Loth Appeal. Even when Fett was wrapped up in Rancor training, 8D8 had no qualms about interrupting. Duty calls, after all, even if the boss was busy. 000, aka Triple Zero. Triple Zero, or Trip for short, wasn't your garden variety protocol droid. Outfitted in dark silver with a penchant for etiquette and pain, this Cybot Galactica 3PO model took a sinister turn after Dr. Afra and Darth Vader woke him up. With his partner in crime, BT1, he took on the galaxy, serving missions and mayhem in equal measure, sticking with Afra even after her staged death. Under that standard 3PO facade, Triple Zero was a walking torture chamber. Afra tricked out his chassis to withstand heat, and his arms were anyone's nightmare. Syringes shielded for field work, scalpel fingers for impromptu surgeries, and palms that could zap her life away. One jab could down a Wookiee, or dispense enough Mandalorian Xenotox to make even the hardiest fall. But even with all that hardware, it was Trip's soft spot for BT-1 that showed he had a heart, albeit a twisted one. When BT-1 bit the dust temporarily, Triple Zero was out for blood. He wasn't driven by revenge, or so he claimed, but he wasn't above settling scores or dreaming of a droid-led galaxy either. And though he'd scrap an organic or droid without a second thought, the quiet life bored him to his circuits. No surprise for a droid who found solace in the scream of his victims, rather than the silence of retirement. I want this mission to go precisely as planned. We need to acquire the Imperial Codes for our attack on the Thor- AP-5, Rebels. AP-5, an RA-7 protocol droid nicknamed AP, had seen better days before he became an Imperial Inventory droid. From a strategic analyst during the Clone Wars to a stock taker with a grudge, his demotion didn't exactly sit well with him. His sour disposition didn't win him any fans among the Imperials, but it was Chopper, the rebel astromech, who ended up his unlikely buddy after liberating him from his restraining bolt. Despite 
his grouchy exterior, AP-5 had a soft spot for the Rebel crew. Feeling a twinge of sadness over Ahsoka Tano's fate, his know-how of Imperial containers came in handy for the Rebels, even if his inner pessimist doubted their chances. He wasn't the best at making friends, often butting heads with Zeb, whom he saw as muscle with less finesse. Yet, AP-5 could pull his weight and then some. He played the fool to Imperial stormtroopers to aid a rescue mission and had the savvy to snag clearance codes with finesse. His pride could be a bit much, and he didn't always play nice, even with his droid pals. But when push came to shove, AP-5 was a rebel through and through, using his insider info and meticulous mind to keep the Ghost crew a step ahead of the Empire. In space, AP-5's metal body was more than just a shell, it was a tool turning him into a space-walking, ship-climbing machine. His stint with solitude and space knee brace showed he had a contemplative side, even if a rescue mission spoiled his peace. The hangar. You. You're coming with me. We will not. We are official Kaminoans. Don't touch me! AZI-3, The Clone Wars, The Bad Batch. AZI-3, or just AZ to his pals, was the Grand Army of the Republic's med droid during The Clone Wars. This AZ series surgical assistant wasn't just about patching up troops, he ended up on a wild ride with ARC Trooper 5s, digging into a mystery that reached all the way to the top of the Republic. They cracked the code on the inhibitor chips, and covering a dark plot that spelled doom for the Jedi. With his cheery, can-do attitude and strict adherence to rules, AZ was a top-notch surgeon and a whiz with the cloning facility's tech. He had a soft spot for the clones he patched up, which Fives banked on to get AZ's help with Tup's troubling case. The duo's bond turned AZ into quite the daredevil, braving dangers that went beyond the operating table. This little droid was all set for action, kitted out with retractable arms for surgery and a scomp link for slicing into systems. Floating around on his repulsor lifts, he could zip through the hallways of Topoka City like a mini speeder when the going got tough. In the end, AZ I3 was more than just a medical droid, he was a friend to clones and a key player in a saga that changed the galaxy forever. Ready to make friends. Roger, roger. Mr. Bones. Mr. Bones, a B-1 series battle droid turned rogue droid, was the handiwork of Temin Wexley, who cobbled him together from scrap beneath mirror. This droid wasn't just nuts and bolts, he had flair, humming and singing as he gleefully dismantled foes. More than a bodyguard, he was a comrade to Temin and, in time, a quirky fixture in Nora Wexley's New Republic crew. Bones was a combat artist, his programming a mashup of combat droids, martial arts, General Grievous's moves, and Ryloth Dancer's grace. His attachment to Temin was almost human-like, showing a gentle side to his friends and a feral one to enemies. He even grew fond of Nora. Once relieved, she survived a crash. With Temin's team, Bones played the jester, breaking out in dance, well, just because. However, he was vicious when he chose, once plucking a butterfly just to tear its wings off. He was tuned into Temin's moods, sensing the boy's distress with uncanny accuracy. In battle, Mr. Bones was a staunch guardian. He could self-repair, thanks to his arm system, even when reduced to a pile of parts. Underneath the humor, he had a brutal streak, one shredding an Imperial officer for wrecking him. His end hit Temin hard. Losing the droid was more than metal. He was family. His weaponry was just as eclectic as his look. A telescoping eye here, a vibrating blade there, and an astromech arm to whack enemies. Despite frequent repairs, the wear and tear of battle started to show, with glitches creeping into his once impeccable timing. But through it all, Bones remained a fiercely devoted and utterly unique droid among the stars. I've been teaching younglings how to construct lightsabers longer than you've been alive. Hu Yang, the clone was Ahsoka. Hu Yang was an old school Mark IV architect droid with a knack for crafting lightsabers and spinning tales about them. Aboard the Jedi ship Crucible, he was the go-to professor for Jedi younglings, guiding them through their rite of passage for millennia. And we're talking big names here, like Yoda and Mace Windu, who both got the saber building chops under his watchful sensors. Locking in around 25,020 BBY, Hu Yang had been in the lightsaber game long enough to claim a thousand generations on his resume. But what about the droid's backstory? Well, that's more hush-hush, the stuff of youngling whispers and wild guesses. Some said he turned up at the Jedi Temple in a mysterious blue box way before before he ever started the Sabre gig. But no matter the origin tale, Hu Yang's mission was clear as a kyber crystal. Jet off to Island with the newbies, watch them score their crystals, and then get down to the serious business of building a lightsaber that was all their own. R4, P17, Attack of the Clones. R4, P17, or, or R4 for short, rolled out from Industrial Automaton's droid line as a savvy feminine astromech sidekick to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Before the Clone Wars kicked off, R4 was right there with Kenobi, unraveling the plot against Senator Amidala and tagging along from Rainy Kamino to Dusty Geonosis. When the Clone Wars were in full swing, R4 got an upgrade with an astromech body, giving her free reign to scoot around beyond the confines of Kenobi's Jedi Starfighter. She even got a taste of Tatooine's sandy antics, 
giving some nosy jowers a zap when they startled her. She was part of the team that jetted off to Teth, pitching in to help Skywalker and Tano with a Hutlet hostage crisis. R4's last ride was a doozy, sipping through the chaos of the Battle of Coruscant blew to Kenobi's interceptor. As they darted toward General Grievous's invisible hand to spring Chancellor Palpatine, buzz droids swarmed them. Kenobi's quick thinking wasn't quick enough to save R4, whose dong got snapped off by the droids, marking the end of her trusty service. Let's go back and tell Master Luke. Goodness gracious me. TT-8L-Y7 Return of the Jedi The TT-8L-Y7 gatekeeper droid was like a nosy neighbor, always sticking its eye stalk out where it was needed, <laughs> or not, crafted by Servo Droid Inc. These droids were the ultimate watchdogs, popping up everywhere from Republic outposts to the shady corners of a Trandoshan scavenger ship. You could spot one of these tattletales guarding the lair of General Grievous, and even squawking at folks at the front door of Jabba the Hutt's Tatooine pad, with their trademark orange peeper and a voice that could scratch Jura Steel, they weren't winning any popularity contests. These droids were a paranoid security manager's dream, vetting visitors and sniffing out weapons with a zeal that earned them their nickname. But for all their quirks, they were effective, doubling as holocams to keep an electronic eye on things. WA-7 Waitress Droid Attack of the Clones WA-7 Waitress Droids, part of the WA series, were, uh, as the name suggests, waitresses. You'd find them zipping around with trays and orders, like Flo, who had the gig at Dex's Diner on Coruscant. These droids didn't just serve up meals, they served looks with their distinctive one-wheel design. Mawigo was another one of these service butts, making the rounds at plop dribbles on Stobar. These mechanical waitstaff were a common sight, even in the cosy corners of the Gilroy Plaza Diner. We will discuss the location of your hidden rebel base. Interrogation Droid A New Hope Interrogator droids, the not-so-friendly persuaders, specialized in prying secrets loose through pain. Models like the ITO were infamous for their mind probes, zapping away at the psyches of the victims. These droids didn't just stick to organics, they torment their fellow droids without batting an optical sensor. With personalities as twisted as their purpose, they seemed to take a dark delight in their work. During the Clone Wars, you'd find these machines lurking in separatist lockups. The Empire kept the tradition alive, using them in their own stark bases. Even the Underworld world got in on the action. Jabba the Hutt's palace had its own dank chamber for such cruel contraptions. Bounty hunter Cad Bane had one named Jono in his employ, showing that freelancers liked their own tools of the trade. Fast forward three decades to the Battle of Endor, and the First Order's carrying the torch, with fresh models under the chilling watch of Kylo Ren. Whether in the hands of the state or the syndicates, interrogator droids were the stuff of nightmares across the stars. Really splendid. We have been without an interpreter since our master got angry with our last protocol droid and... EV-99, Return of the Jedi. EV-99, affectionately known as 99 or Eve to some, wasn't an average Merindata EV series supervisor droid. Initially crafted to tinker with moisture evaporators, she met a fault in her programming that sent her down a darker path. Jabba saw potential in her twisted tastes and put her in charge of his droid crew, where she and her buddy 8D8 ran the show with iron pincers. Once a diligent mechanic, Eve's glitch turned her into a droid's nightmare. She took a little too much pleasure in pushing her mechanical peers to the brink, or over it. To her own kind, she was a tyrant, quick to dish out brutal assignments or the occasional shock treatment, especially to sassbacks like R2-D2. Despite her sinister streak, she was sharp enough to pull one over on unsuspecting Imperials, and her mastery of droid suffering was without equal. Battered but never beaten, 99 had a look that matched her personality. Bronze plates, a trio of photoreceptors, and a custom-fitted third eye that loved to watch her handiwork. A vocal flap might not have synced with her words, but it did nothing to soften her abrasive tones. Eve's innards were a patchwork of self-modifications, making her immune to pesky things like restraining bolts. By the time the Empire fell, she traded Jabba's droid dealing for slinging drinks at Chelman's Cantina. Tell the Jawas the Rodian left. R5-D4, A New Hope R5-D4, the runt of the R5 line from Industrial Automaton, wheeled his way through the dusty streets of Mos Espa on Tatooine, crossing paths with young Anakin Skywalker long before the stars would align for the Rebel Alliance. Decked out in white and red, R5 was a droid with a case of the Why Me? His glitch-prone lineage, making freedom a far-off fantasy. Yet, hope sparked when Jawas prepped him for sale, clearing out the sand, shining him up, hoping some wanderer would take him off their hands. Once a rebel, always a rebel at heart, R5 carried the weight of lost memories and a longing to break free from the sand crawler that held him captive. His frustration peaked when R2-D2, a droid with a shinier shell and a mission of galactic weight, showed up. R5's annoyance at R2 turned to empathy once he got wind of the stakes. <laughs> 
Droidica, the Phantom Menace. Droidicas, also known as destroyers or rollies, were the rolling terrors of the Trade Federation and, later, the CIS's battle for an arsenal. Cooked up by the Colicoids on Collar 4, these droids were all about the business of blasting and shielding to the extreme. Shapeshifters by design, they tuck into a ball, sip across battlefields at breakneck speeds, and unfurl to unleash havoc with their twin blasters, all while snug behind nigh impenetrable shields. Clad in tough bronzium armor, Droidicas weren't picky about pronouns, he, she, it, as long as they could get their blasters firing. Their deflector shields were a nightmare for clone troopers. Those shields laughed in the face of high-velocity attacks, making direct fire a joke. But their blaster bolts slipped through their shields thanks to some fancy polarization while keeping enemy fire out. These metal monsters had a couple of Achilles heels, though. Sneak up behind them when they're blind, or lob an EMP grenade their way and you could fry them. Or, if you had something big and heavy, just drop it on them like squashing a bug. That's how you turn a droidica from destroyer to scrap metal. Medically, she's completely healthy. For reasons we can't explain, we are losing her. G87 Analysis Droid Revenge of the Sith The G87 Medical Analysis Unit was the high-class dock of droid medicine made by Chiwab Amalgamated Pharmaceuticals as their answer to Gintex 21B. Designed with a Kalumi touch, the G87 was a sleek, multi-limbed, rolling medic that could be spotted in swanky hospitals or rubbing elbows with the galaxy's elite. With a look that was all business and no species mimicry, the G87 was made to make any alien patient feel at ease. It boasted a humanoid-ish torso, three handy limbs, and a head unit that wouldn't look out of place in a holodrama. Decked out in grey and black with splashes of bright green and blue, this droid was a walking, uh, well, floating med bay, complete with a hologram projector for show-and-tell diagnostics. The G87 could diagnose, slice and dice with the best of them, all while learning on the job thanks to its heuristic processor. It chatted in binary, interfaced with computers, and its whisper quiet repulsor lift meant it could glide around on or without stirring up dust or germs. Its child-like head and non-threatening vibe made it a hit with patients while its programming was so peace-loving it couldn't harm a fly, unless said fly was threatening its patient, and even then, its stun settings all the way. The GH7 was the droid that you wanted by your hospital bed. Smart, gentle, and with a bedside manner smoother than a hut sales pitch. <laughs> Battle Droids, the Phantom Menace. Battle Droids were metal soldiers that stormed across star systems and were built to fight. From the clattering B1s to the rolling Droidicas, these clankers came in all shapes and sizes, packing blasters and attitude across the galaxy. The Separatist Droid Army, led by the notorious General Grievous, deployed waves of these mechanical warriors against the Republic's clone troopers during the Clone Wars. But, like all good things for the bad guys, it came to an end. When the Empire rose, it flicked the off switch on these droid armies, outlawing them under Imperial decree. Just like that. The galaxy's battle bot saga turned into a silent museum of cold metal. B2 Emo, aka B2 or B. Andor. B2 Emo, also known as B2 or just B, was the droid sidekick of the Andor clan, doing the heavy lifting and scrap hauling with a steadfast spirit. This boxy red bot with black sensors rolled around on mechanum wheels and was always ready to assist Cassian Andor, who'd eventually throw it in with the Rebel Alliance. More than just nuts and bolts, B was a curious little machine, always poking his sensor into Cassian's business, eager to lend a helping claw or wheel. In fact, he'd go the extra mile to keep Cassian's shady dealings under wraps, even when cornered by the law. B's loyalty was ironclad, his circuits sealed tighter than a vault when it came to his human buddy's whereabouts. By 5 BBY, the years were catching up with B, his speech circuit stuttering, and his data processing not what it used to be. But in the community of Ferrix, B was more than hardware. He was a mate, a confidant, and part of the family fabric. When the Empire roughed him up, the locals were quick to have his back, and gear-wise, B was modest but practical. He had an electroshock prod for those just-in-case moments, whether it was a comforting presence for the grieving or just a reliable help around the homestead. BT-1, aka BT. BT-1 was an astromech with a twist. Well, under that unassuming exterior was a full-on arsenal. This droid's first act was a rampage at the Tarkin Initiative base, followed by a mic drop self-destruct sequence and a casual space float. Dr. Afra stumbled upon this ticking time bomb and, with the help of Protocol Droid Triple Zero, got BT back in action. Instead of handing him over to the droid Gotra as planned, Afra enlisted him and Triple Zero into Darth Vader's service, forming the Darkseid's most fearsome tech team. BT's initial 
special programming had all the warmth of half cold, violent, and downright nasty. But post Afra's tweaks, this droid was ready to follow orders without going off the deep end. BT and Triple Zero were quite the pair, rolling and scheming through the galaxy, possibly even hitting droid friendship goals. In terms of gear, BT-1 was like a walking battle station, rocket boosters for quick getaways, an array of blasters, flamethrowers, and missile launchers for when diplomacy just wouldn't cut it. He could even churn out his own ammo by keeping the party going. Need a recon, buddy? Hm, he had a deployable drone for that. And for close encounters, a circular saw. <laughs> because, huh, why not? C-110P, aka Chopper, Rebels, Forces of Destiny, Ahsoka, Rogue One. C-110P, better known as Chopper or Chop, was the cantankerous yet loyal astromech droid with a flair for mischief. Built by Industrial Automaton, this C-1 series droid found a home with the Spectres, a rebel cell fighting the good fight against the Empire. Chopper was their go-to mechanic for the Ghost, their VCX-100 light freighter. His advanced age, combined with a lack of spa days, meant he developed a personality that was as prickly as a cactus. Argumentative and mischievous, Chopper was a grumpy old bot, but his heart, or whatever droids had, was in the right place when it came to his crew. Chopper's adventures with the Spectres were far from dull. He once nearly sent Ezra tumbling off the ghost and didn't bat a sensor. He wasn't the most sociable droid, often clashing with other mechanical beings like R2-D2. However, he did show a soft spot for Hera, who'd rescued him from a wrecked Y-Wing, and he was always ready to roll up his, uh, well, wheel into action for a mission. His friendship with the protocol droid AP-5 was a bond of grumpy droid solidarity, helping the Phoenix Rebels find a new base on Atalan. Chopper's adventures continued with the Spectres as they joined the wider alliance to restore the Republic. CH-33P The Clone Wars Cheap, a C-series astromech with a thing for loyalty and bravery, was part of the crew aboard the Star Destroyer Tribunal during the final days of the Clone Wars. Post the Siege of Mandalore, with Maul in cuffs and Ahsoka Tano on board, things went south real fast when Order 66 turned the galaxy upside down. Cheap, alongside R7A7 and RGG1, didn't hesitate to side with Ahsoka as she dodged the suddenly hostile clone troopers. This plucky droid played a crucial part in cornering Clone Commander Rex, using some door tricks to trap him for Ahsoka. Then, the droid trio helped lug Rex to the medical bay to get that pesky inhibitor chip out of his head. When the time came to skedaddle from the tribunal, Cheap was on deck, prepping a shuttle for the great escape. While Ahsoka and Rex were playing cat and mouse with the clones, our droid hero snuck around the hangar, dropping platforms left and right to give the duo a fighting chance. But then Maul made his move for the shuttle, and amidst the chaos, R7A7 got blasted to bits. Despite the loss, Cheap and GG kept on, working the hangar's platforms to help Ahsoka and Rex reach safety. But their bravery was met with tragedy as the clones turned on them, ending their heroic journey in a blaster's flash. You know, if you would just tell me what it is you're doing back there, I could probably be of some assistance. That is preposterous. I have no memory. Toto 360, The Clone Wars, The Bad Batch. Todo 360, a pint-sized techno-service droid from Vertseth, was crafted by Vertseth Automata and stood at a mere 0.66 meters. Programmed with a masculine touch, Todo eventually found himself in the company of the notorious bounty hunter Cad Bane during the Clone Wars. Despite often being sidelined by Bane, Todo was nothing if not loyal, always ready to dive into missions, no questions asked. One of Todo's more notable gigs was the heist of a holocron from the Jedi Temple a job cooked up by Darth Sidious himself. Equipped with a security chip to bypass Jedi defenses, Todo, along with Bane and shapeshifter Kato Parasiti, slipped into the temple. While Parasiti worked her Jedi disguise, Todo and Bane zeroed in on the holocron vault, but things went sideways at the communications center, where Todo's cover as a maintenance droid fell apart. In a twist, Todo met his end not at the hands of the Jedi, but due to a bomb Bane had sneakily planted in him to cause a diversion. Despite his service droid label, Todo wasn't shy about getting his circuits dirty. He aided Bane in capturing targets, occasionally dishing out snark to their prisoners. There he is. And a calm quiet fell over the castle once more. It's hard not to feel bad for them, but trust me, they Emmy, 8D9. Emmy, an ancient protocol droid with a past as colorful as a nebula, was the iron-fisted law enforcer in Maskanata's castle on Takodana. She wasn't just any droid. This one had a history as an assassin and a translator for the galaxy's underbelly, with whispers that she might have even kicked off her operational life with the Jedi Order. Older than Mass herself, Emmy was a relic among the castle's eclectic inhabitants, her memory a patchwork quilt thanks to frequent reprogramming. A free droid by choice, she kept order in Maz's establishment, a hub for travelers looking for a drink or a bed. By 382 BBY, Emmy had taken up night shifts, serving drinks and keeping an eye out for trouble, like the departure of the Grim Devourer, a ship tied to Maz's rivals, 
the dank Grax. Fast forward to 5 ABY, and Emmy was still at it, breaking up brawls with a zap of her fingers. When Romwell Crass Jr., an ISB agent, got too big for his boots, she laid him out flat with a jolt of electricity, then tossed him and his adversary into the castle's cooler. More than just muscle, Emmy was Maz's confidant, strolling the parapets and sharing in her unease about a disturbance in the force. Always the faithful aid, she got the stranger's fortune prepped for Maz's impromptu galactic tour. With a bronzium exoskeleton and spikes that meant business, she could converse in basic and droid speak, and her fingers, tipped with golden filaments, were perfect for keeping rowdy patrons in line. PZ-4CO PZ-4CO, also known as PZ, was the tall, blue-plated PZ protocol droid, working for the Resistance years after the dust had settled on the Battle of Endor. Stationed at the Dakar base, PZ was the droid in the control rooms, doling out technical know-how and keeping the lines of communication buzzing for the Resistance's big shots. But what was PZ's claim to fame? Well, she was tapped to help General Leia Organa pen her memoirs. It wasn't a walk in the park to get Leia on board, 44 days of persuasion to be exact. But PZ, with a nudge from Major Kalawan Emmett, was adamant. After all, Leia's tales from her Rebel Alliance days were gold for the Resistance's morale. So, with her hollow recorder popping out of her torso, PZ sat down with Leia to chronicle Operation Yellow Moon, a mission from the eve of the Endor showdown. She knew these stories were more than just history. They were beacons of inspiration in their fight against the First Order. A droid of towering stature, PZ's blue armor was marked with distinctive red accents. Her programming gave her a feminine voice, fitting for her role as a chronicler and symbol within the Resistance. Through her work, PZ didn't just record history, she became a part of it. Lola 59 Lola 59, or Lola for short, was more than just a toy droid to Princess Leia of Alderaan. Decked out in white and red plates with wings and antenna, Lola was a blend of charm and utility, complete with a secret stash of miniature tools. During 9 BBY, Lola was right there with Leia during her abduction by Vec Nokru's crew, aimed at drawing out Obi-Wan Kenobi. Despite her small size, Lola was a feisty defender, teaming up with Kenobi to protect Leia. Even when the third sister slapped a restraining bolt on her, Lola didn't stay down for long. Once free, she became a part of the Hidden Path, a beacon of hope for those evading the Empire's grasp. Lola's end came in Zero BBY, in the tragedy that befell Alderaan. As the Death Star Super Laser targeted the planet, Lola met her end alongside countless Alderaanians, marking a sorrowful chapter in the galaxy's history. As for her characteristics, she was expressive, using her casing and wings to communicate emotions and responding to Leia's commands with cheerful beeps. Small enough to fit in a pocket, yet packed with features, Lola had retractable legs for perching and could zip through the air, keeping pace with a running child. The toolkit was surprisingly versatile for a toy droid, housing gadgets like a buzzsaw, glow rod, and even an arc welder. Andrew's a super tactical droid. General Kalani, The Clone Wars, Rebels Kalani, an ST-series military strategic analysis and tactics droid with a mind of his own, stood out in the Separatist droid army during the Clone Wars. In 20 BBY, Count Dooku dispatched him to Onderon to squash a pesky resistance movement. But Kalani's cold logic deemed the planet's conquest a waste of resources after a string of setbacks, leading to a strategic withdrawal to Agamar on Dooku's orders. When the Clone Wars wound down, Kalani got the shutdown signal, but suspecting a Republic ruse, he kept his droid forces active on Agamar. They lingered there in a state of limbo, long after the war's end and the rise of the Empire. Seventeen years post-war, a group of rebels scavenging for munitions on Agamar ran into Kalani. The tactical droid, still clinging to old war strategies, captured the rebels and roped them into a battle simulation to score a posthumous win for the Separatists. However, an unexpected Imperial assault forced Kalani and the rebels to team up, fending off their mutual enemy before parting ways. Kalani was 1.94 meters tall. He was a cold, calculating commander, obsessed with victory and devoid of empathy. Whether torturing rebel leaders or executing uncooperative kings, Kalani's only concern was the tactical outcome. His refusal to shut down post Order 66 was a testament to his suspicion and autonomy, traits that kept him and his forces active well into the age of the Empire, fixated on rewriting the final chapter of the Clone Wars. Yes, Viceroy. Captain, we've searched the ship, and there is the. Ooh, nine. Oom-9, an Oom command battle droid, was the field general for the Trade Federation's forces during the invasion of Naboo in 32 BBY. Towering at 1.91 meters, Oom-9 was a sight in his bone-white armor, marked with a distinctive yellow, which indicated his high rank. When Queen Amidala rallied the Gungan Grand Army, Oom-9 led the droid army against them, executing orders from Nuke Gunray and Rune Hako. 
commanding from the comfort of his own armored assault tank. He pushed his droid troops to quash the uprising, focusing on overrunning settlements and smashing communication lines to keep the invasion under wraps. Yet, um 9s triumph was fleeting. The droids, including the commander himself, faced abrupt deactivation when Anakin Skywalker took out the droid control ship orbiting above. This sudden shutdown left um 9 and his troops frozen mid-battle, designed for war. um 9 lacked the ability for independent thought, relying on directives from the central control computer aboard a Luka Hulk-class battleship. Despite this, he was specifically programmed to lead the ground assault on Naboo, a task he executed with cold efficiency until his abrupt shutdown. As for gear, Um-9 wasn't just about looking imposing. He had his own personalized tank, a set of electro-binoculars for long-distance battlefield scouting, and a pair of antenna for staying in touch with Gunray and Harko. His vocabulator also played a crucial role in communicating strategies and updates. They are on to us. WAC-47 – The Clone Wars WAC-47, a dumb series pit droid, took on the skies and more during the Clone Wars. As part of the Republic's D-Squad, this modified droid had dreams, or whatever droids have, bigger than just being a pilot. He was a character all right, often mistakenly calling his boss, Colonel Meba Gascon, Corporal, a mix-up he blamed on a glitch in his programming. Initially, Wack and Gascon were like oil and water. Gascon saw Wack and his droid squad as nothing more than tools, while Wack yearned for recognition. Their journey, filled with ups and downs, eventually led to mutual respect and understanding, especially after their escapades on Abafar. In a turn of events, Wack even earned a promotion to Corporal, a title he wore with pride. Whether it was getting under Gascon's skin or admiring a hologram of C-3PO, whom he dubbed a handsome fella, Wack 47 brought a unique flair to the D-Squad. R2-K2 R2-K2, a droid with a heart of gold and pink plates to match, had quite the journey through the galaxy's tumultuous history. This compassionate, feminine-programmed R2 series astromech droid standing at 1.09 meters witnessed the rise and fall of empires, from the Galactic Republic to Leia Organa's resistance. Back in the Clone Wars, R2-K2 was a key player in the Republic Navy, rubbing shoulders with the 501st Legion. Aboard the Resolute Anakin Skywalker's flagship, she was involved in vital missions like searching for Rota the Hutlet and rescuing Jedi Master Ayla Secura. Fast forward over 50 years, and R2-K2 hadn't missed a beat. She was now a crucial cog in the Resistance's ground forces, busy keeping starfighters battle-ready at the Dakar base. When the Resistance took on the Starkiller base, R2-K2 was in the thick of it, later waving off Rey and Chewbacca as they started their quest to find Luke Skywalker. R2-K2 had personality. Her white and pink armor housed a light blue photoreceptor. As for her toolkit, she was kitted out with all the astromech essentials, like an arc welder, a hollow projector, and various hidden gadgets. Her three treads ensured she kept her balance, whether on the smooth hangar floors of Dakar or the rough terrain of a battlefield. GG RGG-1, also known as GG, was a fearless astromech droid with a flair for heroics during the Clone Wars' final days. Decked out in striking black and gold, GG was programmed with feminine traits. She served aboard the Tribunal, a Galactic Republic Star Destroyer, during the Siege of Mandalore. As the Clone Wars reached a climactic finale with Order 66, GG took center stage. Alongside fellow droids CH-33P and R7A7, GG joined forces with former Jedi Padawan Ahsoka Tano. Their mission was to save Clone Commander CT-7567, known as Rex, from the mind-controlling effects of his inhibitor chip. The trio of droids trapped Rex and transported him to the medical bay for the chip's removal, all while under the threat of other clone troopers who had turned against their Jedi allies. Gigi's loyalty to Tano was unwavering, even in the face of great danger. She bravely assisted in welding shut the door to the medical bay, keeping the mind-controlled clones at bay while Rex's chip was removed. However, Gigi's story, much like many others in those tumultuous times, ended in tragedy. While aiding Tano and Rex's escape from their doomed Star Destroyer, Gigi met her end at the hands of the mind-controlled clones. Ned B. Obi-Wan Kenobi Ned B, a tough and silent loader droid, was a true unsung hero on the planet Mapuzo during the Imperial Era. He was deeply involved with the Hidden Path, an underground movement dedicated to smuggling surviving Jedi to safety. His base of operations was a discreet safe house inside a droid maintenance building in a mining village. In 9 BBY, Ned B aided Obi-Wan Kenobi and Leia Organa, two of the galaxy's most wanted fugitives. When stormtroopers came knocking, Ned B prepared for battle. Although questioned by a stormtrooper, his stoic presence ensured the troopers eventually moved on without incident. Ned B's journey eventually led him to Jabim, where his story reached a heroic and tragic end. In a final stand against stormtroopers, he selflessly sacrificed himself to ensure the escape of his fellow Hidden Path members. His last act, a protective shield for Jurith against the onslaught, epitomized his bravery and selflessness. A droid of few words, 
or rather, not at all, Ned B communicated through actions rather than speech. Interestingly, his chest bore the inscription Ned W in Orobesh, while Ned 1 was printed on his back, a curious mismatch to his official designation. R3-S6 R3-S6, known in the galaxy as Goldie and Stubby, was an astromech droid with a twist. A double agent for the Separatists during the Clone Wars. Assigned to Anakin Skywalker after R2-D2 went MIA, Goldie's true mission was to sabotage Republic operations from the inside. Goldie's stint with Skywalker and his Padawan Ahsoka Tano began with the hunt for the lost R2-D2. Tano, trying to warm up to the new droid, coined the nickname Goldie, playing off Skywalker's role as Gold Leader of the Gold Squadron. Skywalker, however, wasn't easily fooled. He sensed something off about Goldie. Their search led them to a Trandoshan scavenger ship, where they met Gar Nacht. Despite Nacht's assurances to the contrary, Skywalker and crew scarred the ship for R2-D2, but their efforts were in vain. They eventually left, none the wiser to R3-S6's true allegiance. Manufactured by Industrial Automaton, R3-S6 was decked out with standard astromech gear, a computer interface arm, an electroshock prod, a hollow projector, and more. Over time, Goldie's overly dramatic sabotage acts raised eyebrows but didn't immediately out him as a spy. Skywalker's initial suspicions, however, hinted at the truth behind this seemingly clumsy droid's actions. GA-97 – The Force Awakens GA-97, the seemingly ordinary servant droid at Maskanata's castle, was more than meets the eye. With a cover as just another droid in the bustling hub on Takadana, GA-97 had a secret allegiance with the Resistance. In 34 ABY, when Han Solo arrived at the castle with Rey, Finn, and the sought-after astromech droid BB-8, GA-97 recognized BB-8 as the missing link in the Resistance's search. Acting discreetly, GA-97 used the Resistance's intelligence network to alert them of BB-8's location. This vital piece of information set the wheels in motion, leading to the Resistance's mobilizations towards Takodana. Despite its key role, GA-97 maintained a low profile. The droid was designed with practicality in mind, a bipedal body featuring a chest-based power plant and collapsible legs for easy storage. Its appearance was marked by a mix of red, yellow, and green plating, along with black sensors. When communicating with the Resistance, GA-97 used an alien dialect, further camouflaging its true purpose. GA-97's actions at Maskanata's castle are a testament to the droid's understated bravery and commitment to the Resistance cause. U9C4, this laser cutter will slice... U9C4. Around 20 BBY, the unassuming U9C4, also known as C4, got the call of duty to join the Republic's elite D-Squad. Under the stern command of Colonel Meeber Gascon, who saw droids more as tools than team members, C4 and his squadmates braced for a mission that would test their mettle to the core. Before embarking, the droids made a pit stop at Parwan Dr. Gubakas for some vital upgrades. C4 was outfitted with a laser cutter so potent it could slice through almost anything, but with great power came a great catch. The laser's hefty recoil demanded Cifa to lock down during use, a detail that would later lead to a comical mishap. Their mission aboard a dreadnought saw C4 using his new laser to momentarily cut the power in the comm vault. In the heat of the moment, however, C4 forgot to anchor himself and was flung back by the recoil, though he successfully completed his task. The mission took a wild turn when D-Squad encountered a swarm of ice comets, crash landing on the barren world of Abafar. There, they stumbled upon Ponzora and crossed paths with Gregor, an amnesiac clone trooper. With Gregor's help, C4 and his droid comrades commandeered a shuttle, bidding farewell to Abafar. Their journey took another twist aboard the Renown, where they discovered a separatist scheme to destroy a Republic space station with Rhydonium. C4 and D-Squad, small in stature, rose to the occasion, averting the catastrophic plan. Post-mission, C4, alongside his droid brethren, found themselves assigned to the same platoon as Colonel Gascon. From a mere tool in the eyes of their commander to heroes of a high-stakes mission, C4 and D-Squad's adventure was a true underdog story, showcasing that even the smallest droids can make the biggest difference in the galaxy. Nice to see a familiar face. Ichuta. How rude! TC-14 TC-14 was a silver TC series protocol droid with a feminine touch, who was created by Cybot Galactica and lived a life of constant bewilderment aboard the Trade Federation's flagship, Sokak. Regular memory wipes, way more than any droid's fair share, stripped her of any semblance of personality, leaving her perpetually perplexed and memoryless. In the year 32 BBY, TC-14 found herself amid galactic politics when the Sakak was part of the blockade over Naboo. Her routine life took an unexpected turn when she met Jedi Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi, who were there to negotiate the blockade's end. Little did she know, her report about their arrival would trigger an assassination attempt by the Nymoidians. Oblivious and dutiful, TC-14 unwittingly played her part, serving drinks to the Jedi while her masters plodded in the shadows. 
The assassination attempt spiralled into chaos, but the Jedi let TC-14 escape unscathed. However, fate wasn't kind to her. She met her end during the Battle of Naboo, having been transferred to the battleship Vutun Palar. TC-14's life was a series of serving and greeting, her programming never quite aligning with the duplicitous and violent schemes of the Trade Federation. Trapped in a loop of confusion, she was a bystander in a war that she didn't understand. Despite the odds, her politeness never wavered, even in the most stressful of circumstances, like apologizing to battle droids while fleeing a gas-filled room. Standing at 1.67 meters, with yellow photoreceptors shining against her silver plating, TC-14 was a figure of protocol in a world of chaos, forever trying to comprehend the bewildering event unfolding around her. It's still quite a mess. The power lines are leaking, the navigation is intermittent, and the hyperdrive... Q90, the Mandalorian. Q90, or Zero as he was often called, ventured into the murky world of mercenary work during the era of the New Republic. Standing at a notable 1.8 meters, Zero's dark grey plating and bug-like photoreceptors gave him a distinct and somewhat intimidating presence. Part of a motley crew of mercenaries led by Ranzar Malk, Zero teamed up with characters like Migs Mayfeld, Berg, Cyan, and the well-known Mandalorian bounty hunter Din Djarin. Their mission was to rescue Kin from the confines of the New Republic prison ship Bothan 5. Zero's journey took a twist when the team double-crossed Din Djarin, leaving him behind in a classic betrayal. Zero, who stayed back on Jarin's gunship, Razor Crest, stumbled upon Grogu, a mysterious infant Jarin had saved earlier. The droid attempted to harm the child but was destroyed by Jarin, who miraculously escaped from his predicament. But Zero's story didn't end there. His remnants, particularly his vocabulator, found a new purpose aboard the Razor Crest. A stranded passenger Jarin was transporting used the droid's remains to communicate while they were stuck on the icy planet of Maldo Kreis. As a protocol droid, Zero was a cut above the rest. Boasting about his superior intellect and quick response time, he often looked down on organics. His piloting skills were top-notch, with the ability to execute maneuvers beyond human capability. Zero was well-equipped for his mercenary lifestyle, carrying an EE-3 carbine rifle and sporting several pouches on his torso for blaster repairs. His rough programming, as described by Malk, made him an intriguing, if not arrogant, member of any team he joined. HK-47 HK-47, a hunter-killer assassin droid, was the brainchild of the Sith Lord, Darth Revan. The droid came to life post-Mandalorian Wars in 3960 BBY. Built for subtler means of eliminating threats, HK-47 embodied deadly efficiency. His journey, marred by a brutal injury and capture in Mandalorian space, led to a memory wipe, erasing his recollections of Revan. Despite his memory loss, HK-47's lethal skills remained intact. He drifted from owner to owner, often causing their deaths before ending up on Tatooine. Here, fate played its hand as he was sold to an amnesiac Revan, aiding him in his quest against the Star Forge and Revan's former Sith apprentice. HK-47 saga continued alongside Revan to the Unknown Regions, and then on the Ebon Hawk, left behind as Revan faced an unknown threat. Damaged, he was found by Mitra Surik, aka the Jedi Exile. Surik repaired him, and HK-47 joined her quest against the HK-50s, a knockoff version he detested and the pursuit of surviving Jedi Masters. Centuries later, HK-47 resurfaced on Mustafar, manipulating spaces to gain a new body, only to turn against them. Despite his defeat, he evaded destruction, leaving a legacy of cunning and brutality. HK-47's combat abilities were unmatched. Adept in stealth and open combat, he was proficient with blaster rifles and various droid weapons. As a Jedi hunter, he knew the most effective tactics and weapons against them, using grenades, sonic weapons, and mines to exploit their weaknesses. His psychological warfare, targeting a Jedi's will and allies, further showcased his strategic acumen. FX-7 in Star Wars Legends, FX-7 was an older model with surprisingly advanced medical capabilities and was a key player in the Rebel Alliance's echo base on the frigid Hoth. Despite its outmoded status, FX-7's sophisticated medical programming and 20 dexterous manipulator arms made it a crucial asset, especially in the resource-strapped echo base medical lab. The droid teamed up with 21B, a fellow medical droid, to save Luke Skywalker. Their year-long partnership was marked by 2-1-B's slightly egotistical attitude, often boasting about being superior to FX-7 despite the latter's invaluable assistance. After the intense Battle of Hoth, FX-7 narrowly escapes aboard the Bright Hope, the last GR-75 medium transport fleeing the planet. Following a daring rescue by bounty hunters 4 Lom and Zuckus, FX-7 found itself reassigned to the Redemption, an EF-76 Nebulon B escort frigate, continuing its vital medical service for the Rebel Alliance. R7A7 R7A7, a dedicated astromech droid with a masculine touch, was a great help for Ahsoka Tano. 
Throughout the tumultuous times of the Clone Wars, R7 was Ahsoka's reliable sidekick, taking the co-pilot seat in her starfighters and sharing countless battles. His loyalty didn't waver, even when Ahsoka stepped away from the Jedi Order. When Order 66 turned the galaxy upside down, R7 stood firmly by Ahsoka's side, alongside fellow droids CH-33P and RGG-1. They captured and de-chipped Clone Commander Rex, a daring act of loyalty and bravery. Sadly, R7 met his end in a blaster fire during a fierce skirmish in the hangar of the crashing tribunal. But even in destruction, he wasn't forgotten. Ahsoka and Rex salvaged his remains, giving him a chance at a new life. Rebuilt and resilient, R7 found a new home with the Martez sisters, allies of Ahsoka working against the Empire. Standing at just under a meter, R7's striking red plating, green highlights and silver dome mirrored Ahsoka's starfighter's aesthetics. He was well equipped for battle and navigation, showing aggressive skills in plotting hyperspace routes and ship repairs. Even in his new role, R7's unique personality quirks, like his special salute, continue to shine, reminding all of his enduring spirit and loyalty to Ahsoka Tano. R1J5, R1J5, Star Wars Resistance. R1J5, also known as Bucket, was the astromech droid of Jarek Yeager, a former Rebellion pilot. This unique droid, standing at 1.1 meters and sporting a distinctly unfinished look with no plating and a black sensor, was a part of Yeager's life. From racing together to settling down at the Colossus refueling platform, Bucket was always at Yeager's side. In his new life, Bucket joined Yeager's repair station and the spirited Team Fireball, where he worked alongside the likes of Tamara Rivora, Niku Vozo, and the incognito resistance spy Kazuda Ziono. His primary role was to keep starships, especially the temperamental Fireball, in tip-top shape. Bucket's personality was as unique as his appearance. Known for his somewhat quirky demeanor, a result of outdated and somewhat glitchy programming, he never failed to express his distaste for disrespect. He wasn't shy about showing his annoyance, whether it was barking at Rivora for an offhand comment or playfully smacking Ziono for a sarcastic remark. His interactions with other droids ranged from friendly to competitive, particularly evident in his dynamic with BB-8 and CB-23. Despite his quirks, R1J5 was more than just a droid. He was equipped with a range of tools, from a spark projector to grasping arms, making him a valuable asset in any mechanical endeavor. His attachment to his helmet, which he regarded almost as a part of himself, highlighted his unique sense of identity among droids. Whether it was waking up Ziona with his built-in alarm or assisting fellow droids, Bucket was a character that brought life and a touch of humor to Jaeger's garage on the Colossus. Marvelous verdict. All right, folks, that wraps up our epic journey through the galaxy of Star Wars, exploring every droid that has beeped, whirred, and clanked its way into our hearts. From the iconic R2-D2's brave escapades to the darkly humorous quips of HK-47, we've seen how these mechanical beings are more than just circuitry and metal. They're heroes, villains, comedians, and at times, the most human characters in the Star Wars universe. Each droid we've discussed today holds a unique place in the vast Star Wars lore. Whether they're assisting in epic space battles, providing comic relief, or even challenging our notions of artificial intelligence, these droids have become integral to the storytelling magic of this beloved saga. If you've enjoyed this mechanical odyssey as much as I have, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more Star Wars content. And remember, whether you're a fan of the Astromex, Protocol droids, or even the lesser-known models, each droid has a story worth telling. May the Force be with you always. And until then, keep your senses sharp and your circuits charged. You know, if you would just tell me what it is you're doing back there, I could probably be of some assistance. That is preposterous. I have no memory of any...